Welcome everyone to day two of our summer seminar on the classical liberal tradition. I'm Jason Cannon and I am directing these seminars for the Institute of Humane Studies. It's a pleasure to have all of you with us today. It's also a pleasure for us to have Professor Eric Mack delivering the first lecture of the day. Eric Mack is Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at Tulane University. His main scholarly project has been the refinement and extension of libertarian-oriented natural rights theory. In fact, he just recently published a book on libertarianism that I would highly recommend. To that end, he has published about 100 scholarly essays on the moral foundations of natural rights and property rights and other topics exploring the nature of liberty. He demonstrates his commitment to rugged individualism by hiking and ba backpacking in the canyon country of the mountains in the American West. The title of his lecture today, his first of two lectures at this seminar, is Natural Rights. Eric, I'll hand over great. to you. Great, great. I'm delighted to be here, although I'd rather be there, but I'm not sure where there exactly would be. Um, great. Um, yesterday morning, as I was taking a long, hot walk along the levee of the Mississippi River, I mentally tore up the first part of the lecture that I had prepared for today. Uh, then I radically reorganized the rest of the lecture. So those of you who have received an advanced outline for that lecture will be reminded that advanced outlines should not be trusted much more than government predictions and promises. My new intention is to structure the second half of this lecture, this brief, too brief lecture, uh, around the idea that each life matters. In putting matters in this way, I'm not disparaging the slogan, Black Life Matters, which is a fine slogan, as long as it means, God damn it, Black Lives Matter too. <laughs> I want to discuss what it might mean to say that each life matters. In what way does each life matter? Uh, to whom does this or that life matter? Does everyone else's life matter? <laughs> Why does everyone else's life matter? And in what way does everyone else's life matter? These are all extremely modest philosophical questions. I'm going to employ a very rough distinction between what I will call the individualist slash natural rights understanding of the slogan that each life matters and what I'll call the radiant end understanding of that slogan. The roughest part about this distinction is that it classifies almost every understanding that is not the individualist and natural rights understanding as a radiant end understanding. And so it rides roughshod over the differences between those. I don't think that will affect the argument here. However, before getting to that particular final phase of the argument, I'm gonna do a number of other things. I'm going to begin by making some comments about what natural rights are or what they would be if they exist. I believe they exist. I'm going to talk a bit about a very nice passage from Isaiah Berlin's Two Concepts of Liberty. Um, I'm then going to give a rundown of Locke's arguments for natural rights. And then I'm going to turn to the last and final section of the paper, which is now labeled Each Life Matters and the Natural Right to liberty. Jason, show me how to tell me how to get rid of the larger screen. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm hoping to get myself back up to. Uh, if you just larger. click it at uh, your mouse button, it will advance to the next slide. Yeah, but I don't want the next slide. Uh, sorry, folks. I want to, oh, people out there are still seeing me in the lodge. Is that right, Jason? Uh, yeah, we're seeing you on the screen as well as okay. the, the PowerPoint. Terrific, terrific. I'm sorry, folks. Good. Uh, so what are natural rights if they exist? Natural rights are, of course, a type of moral right. They're moral claims that people can invoke against being mistreated in certain ways. If I assert a right not to have my shirt seized without my consent, I'm invoking a moral property right. And this is a claim that ought to be protected and not violated 
by legal institutions. If I assert a right to your doing your part to fulfill some contract between us, I am invoking a moral contractual right. And this is a claim that ought to be protected, of course, will not always be by existing legal institutions. Both, prop, both property rights and contractual rights are required rights. They arise out of particular actions or particular interactions that specific individuals have performed. Hence, different people will have different specific property rights and natural rights, uh, property rights and contractual rights. In contrast, natural rights are non-acquired rights. They are the baseline moral rights that all individuals have unless they have genuinely waived or forfeited those rights. They are our original moral rights. These rights, if they exist, are natural in both a negative and a positive sense. They are natural in the negative sense that the existence of your natural rights does not depend upon any particular action that you've performed. Your right not to be killed by others does not depend upon your laying claim to that right, or your declaring your desire to live, or your promising to be grateful if you're not killed, or your promising to pay taxes if you're not killed. Nor does your right not to be killed depend upon others agreeing that you have that right or some political creature granting you that right. If these rights exist, they are natural in the following positive sense. There is something about the nature of persons which is the basis of their possession of these baseline original moral rights. Some deep fact or a set of small set of deep facts about persons is the ground for ascribing these rights to them. Since the relevant deep fact or small set of facts will be a feature of all persons, all persons will have the same natural rights. I want to mention one other important feature of moral rights and hence of natural rights. And that is that the wrongfulness of their violation is due to the character of the violating action rather than the consequences of that action. If we possess a bundle of natural rights, it's certain that one of them is a natural right against being enslaved. So let's think for a moment about what makes slavery a great wrong. Is it the character of enslavement or is it the consequences of enslavement? The consequences can be awful. It can be a reason against being uh, endorsing slavery, but what is the essential wrong of slavery? Until the 1860s, the institution of slavery in the southern states of the United States imposed enormous suffering on millions of people. It also provided benefits for a considerably smaller number of people. Do we have to aggregate the suffering that was caused and the benefits that were engendered to make sure that the suffering exceeded the benefits before we condemn slavery? Surely the answer is no. Enslaving someone is one of those forms of treatment of another individual, which is, as they say, wrong in itself, not merely wrong if and when it has certain net undesirable consequences. Suppose somebody produced a breed of super slaves. Uh, these would be incredibly productive slaves, as productive as the heroes of Atlas Shrugged even but much more easily held in captivity and exploited. Over time, the super slaves replaced the regular slaves who are allowed to wander off and live their own lives. The super slaves are treated as badly as the former slaves were. They are chained, beaten, whipped, ordered around, and recaptured and punished if they try to escape. But now the misery of one super slave makes possible the luxury and pleasures of the entire extended family which owns the slave, plus the families of various cruel overseers as well. If slavery were contingently wrong, i.e. wrong in virtue of its distasteful overall consequences, we would have to engage in a complex empirical inquiry about exactly how many people suffer and to what extent, 
under the new super slave system and exactly how many people benefit and to what extent. Only such an inquiry or a similar calculus of social interests could determine whether the treatment of the super slaves was morally acceptable or unacceptable. Right? If we think of as slavery as something that is wrong on the basis of its consequences. But of course, we don't need such an inquiry. This is because the enslavement by its very character is wrongful. It is an affront to a dishonoring of the moral standing of the enslaved individual. Now that encompasses a position that I am going to spend some time arguing for in this lecture. So we have some idea of what natural rights are. They are fundamental wrongs on the basis of the very character of the way people are treated which all, peop which, peop which all people have an original basic uh, right against suffering. Are there such rights? I think there are, and I'll try to say something about why. Second part of the lecture, Isaiah Berlin on individuals as ends in themselves. And we're gonna come up with a nice, ooh, sorry. There we go. There we go. In his account of the liberal idea of negative liberty, in his great essay, The Two Concepts of Liberty, Isaiah Berlin nicely captures the character of profoundly rights violating actions and provides at least some suggestive remarks about what reason others have to abstain from such rights violating activity. In doing so, he also indicates the deeply individualistic perspective that underlies the liberal view that each person possesses a natural right to liberty. So here's the long passage from Berlin. To manipulate men to, pro to, propel, to propel them towards goals, which you see, but they may not, is to deny their human essence to treat them as objects without wills of their own and therefore to degrade them. That is why to lie to men, to deceive them, that is to use them as means for my, not their own independently conceived ends is in effect to treat them as subhuman, to behave as if their ends are less ultimate and sacred than my own. In the name of what can I ever be justified in forcing men to do what they have not willed or consented to? Only, says Berlin, in the name of some value higher than themselves. But, here's the kicker, there is no value higher than the individual. I am aiming at something desired by me or my group to which I am using other people as means, but this is a contradiction of what I know men to be namely ends in themselves. That's Isaiah Berlin. Berlin mentions several types of treatment of persons that, are, that wrong them and the reasons on the basis of which certain these types of treatments ought to be eschewed. People are wronged when they are manipulated, propelled towards goals that are not their own, treated as means without wills, of, as beings without wills of their own, forced to do what they have not willed or consented to, or are used as means. These are all overlapping descriptions. Why does such treatment wrong those who are subjected to it? Berlin tells us that such treatments wrong persons because all persons have their own independently conceived ends, ends that are as ultimate as the ends of anyone else. When one party imposes such treatment on another, that imposing party acts as though his ends or his value is higher than that of the subjected party. For only something higher than the individual who's imposed upon or higher than the ends of that individual can justify such treatment. The imposing party in effect says, you and your ends are of lesser value than the ends of others who are uh, whose ends are being promoted by this imposition. You and your ends are less ultimate, less supreme, less morally sovereign than the ends of those individuals or groups for whom I act. 
But again, the kicker says, Berlin, there is nothing higher than the individual since each individual's life and well-being are of separate ultimate value, each individual's life and well-being is an end in itself, not to be sacrificed even for others who are equally ends in themselves. That's an important way of putting it. In the kingdom of beings who are ends in themselves, no one is to be treated as a means only to the ends of others. This is and in fact, Kant is invoked by Berlin within this whole passage. Okay. What I want to especially emphasize here is that Berlin has this strongly individualist perception, right? It's the value of each individual. It's the value of each individual living his or her own life as she chooses that in some way underwrites the right that people have. If there was, if it wasn't for this deep underlying value, the right to live one's life in one's own way would be unanchored. Okay. I want to turn now to some of the arguments that Locke gives for essentially the same right, essentially the right to liberty. You have what you have up on the screen now is uh, some passages from Locke, which I may or may not read before I go beyond that. In the decades before Locke wrote, the great political philosopher Thomas Hobbes had argued that rights themselves do not exist unless they are created by the commands of a political sovereign. In the state of nature, there are no rights properly speaking. We only get rights when the sovereign tells us or gives us those rights. According to Hobbes, however, we need rights to live a peaceful and mutually advantageous social order. And so we need political authority to create those rights. This means that we need and should consent to a political sovereign who himself is not bound by any rights since the only rights that people have are the rights that he says they have. If Hobbes' the sovereign says, I command everyone not to kill Mac, Mac has a right against everyone not to be killed until the sovereign says, just kidding. Locke's deepest response to this Hobbesian doctrine is to argue that there are natural moral rights which everyone, including political authorities, whatever political authority comes into existence is bound to respect. Locke appeals to two basic deep facts, the deep facts I was talking about a while back in all of his arguments for natural rights. I wanna mention uh, the first one here, uh, but not read these whole passages that you have before us. Locke holds that each person rationally pursues his or her own happiness. Perhaps we can just look at that final brief line there. Tis a man's proper business to seek happiness and avoid misery. So each person has as his or her own end, his or her own, her own proper and rational end, the promotion of his or her individual happiness. Crucial starting point. In the two treatises, Locke's great work on, uh, it's really the second treatise, that is Locke's great work in political philosophy, Locke does not focus directly on the rationality of the pursuit of personal happiness. Rather, he focuses on the rationality of the pursuit of self-preservation and the rationality of each individual's demand for her, that her own freedom be respected. How do these connect up? Self-preservation comes to the fore for Locke because it is the key condition for each individual's attainment of personal happiness. You don't get much personal happiness if you don't exist. Freedom comes to the fore because according to Locke, freedom from what he calls restraint and violation by others is the key social condition that one needs in order to achieve self-preservation and happiness. 
So if we want to get to freedom from others, violence, and from the restraint they may impose upon one. That's the first fact, deep fact. The second deep fact for Locke is that we are moral equals. Uh, we are equal, moral equals in the sense at least that whatever rights one of us has, everyone else has. Uh, and uh, we're moral equals in the sense that we each have in our own happiness uh, a goal of ultimate value that it's rational for us to pursue. So I'm going to talk now about, as quickly as I can, about uh, uh, three arguments that Locke makes. I'm going to have to truncate this discussion a bit. The first argument that Locke makes I call the generalization argument essentially says everyone rationally claims to be claims makes a claim to freedom against other people but since we're moral equals whatever claim i make for myself as a person i have to grant other people as well so each person's claim for freedom on their own behalf rationally commits them to recognizing a comparable claim of freedom on the part of other people not made for one another's purposes argument, the second one. I'll just read the text that you have before you. This, the state of nature has a law of nature to govern it, that's the rejection of Hobbes, which obliges everyone, and reason which is that law teaches all mankind who will but consult it, that being equal and independent. Equal, we've already talked about, independent means having purposes of one own, one's own, not being born in order to serve other people's purposes. No one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions, period, and being furnished with like facilities, sharing all in one community of nature, that is having the same nature, there cannot be supposed any subordination among us that may authorize us to destroy one another as if we were made for one another's purposes. The language that you saw in Berlin comes closest to recapitulating this particular argument by Locke. There's a third and very important argument by Locke, uh, what I call the by like reason argument. I'm going to skip the actual reading of the argument, but I will give you my gloss on that argument. It's a little more complicated. This is my gloss on uh, Locke's by like reason argument. You have reason to seek your commodious preservation, and each other person by like reason seeks her own commodious self-preservation. But what is the import of this striking fact about other people? that they rationally seek their own self-preservation and happiness for your conduct towards them. That is, we look out in the world and we see that we're not the only beings that have purposes of our own. There are these other creatures out there, like us, who also rationally seek their own preservation and their own happiness. I take Locke to be saying, and you'll see this in my own words later on more, the import for you is not that you should adopt their ends as things that you yourself ought to be busy promoting, maybe at the sacrifice of some of your own ends, rather what you have to do in order to respond appropriately to the fact that the world includes these creatures who like you have ends of their own is to respect their existence as beings with ends of their own and that means not to do things that subordinate them to your ends. One must allow other people to pursue their own ends in the ways that one oneself claims a right to pursue your own ends, your own happiness, and so on. Okay, so that's Locke. Now on to the Berlin Lockean theme uh, that I want to extract from a certain reading of the slogan that each life matters. Uh, so what's on the uh, 
try not to look at this. This is going to come up only at the very end of my talk. And so I'm going to just flip you back to the previous page. On the individualist natural rights understanding of the proposition that each life matters, each person's life matters in itself. Well, the flourishing of each person's life matters in itself. Try to explain what I mean by that. Each person's life going well, each person's achievement of well-being is a separate end in itself. There's a type of deep moral pluralism here, which is part of this individualist worldview. Along with the multiplicity of persons comes a multiplicity of ultimate ends. I have the ultimate end of making my life go as well as it can. You have the ultimate end of making your life go as well as it can. This might involve different qualities and different uh, ways of finding happiness or well-being. But the important thing is that there's this separateness of ultimate ends and purposes. However, uh, one person's ends, ah, Think about a character, which I'm now calling Jane, and her relationship to her own ends versus her relationship to other people who have ends of their own. I say, whereas Joan's ends matter to Joan as outcomes that she ought to pursue. I have these ends. I'm a being with these ends. These ends constitute outcomes that I ought to pursue or to promote, other persons at large matter to Jane on this view as beings who have lives of their own to live. The import for Jane of other persons having at large lives of their own to live is for Jane to honor those persons as being with ends of their own. Jane honors them by not interfering with those individuals in their pursuit of their own ends. One's ends, one's own ends, give one reason to promote those ends. These are my ends. These are the things I ought to go for. That others have ends of their own gives one reason to honor them by not treating them as means to one's own ends. That's the position I'm trying to convey. In contrast to this, and we get understand what I've just said better, but we by contrasting it with an alternative view. In contrast to this, on any radiant end view, and many people hold these views, there is some common putatively higher end to which all persons' lives should be devoted. Here are some of the candidates for such a radiant end. The glorification of God, the achievement of racial purity, the greatest aggregate happiness for the greatest number, the equalization of income or happiness across all people, the triumph of virtue and the eradication of sin, and the victory of the proletariat. Obviously, different advocates of different uh, radiant ends are going to have a fight among themselves. But what they all have in common is the idea that the way each person should conduct him or herself in life, or the way each person should be treated by others in life, is the way in which makes those people most useful, which brings those people into the greatest service of this common radiant end. One way we can do this is by, of course, thinking about each person as a place, a, a site in which a certain amount of the radiant end can be placed. So everything else being equal, it's a good thing if you're an advocate of the greatest happiness, if some particular person's happiness increases. Why is it a good thing? Because it's a good thing that there is a convenient warehouse in which some additional happiness can be achieved. 
What's good about the additional happiness is that the radiant end is more further fulfilled. It's a means to that outcome that somebody else is more happy than he might otherwise have been. But there are other ways in which people can be useful to a radiant end. Since I've been talking about uh, the utilitarian position, let me drag out one of the sort of common examples of highly distasteful treatment of people that the utilitarian radiant end seems to require. And you'll all be familiar with these. They're almost trite at this point. So here you are a person with your nice, healthy organs, internal organs. It turns out that there are five people each of whose lives will be saved if only one of these organs is transplanted into them. Of course, to harvest those organs will mean your death, but there'll be more overall happiness in the world if you donate your organs to save those five, even at the cost of your own life. If you're a good utilitarian, uh, it's clear that you ought to volunteer to be eviscerated. Each of these five people are sites for happiness. So are you, it would be better if we, they could be saved without your life ending, but we can't do it that way. You have to make the sacrifice so that the five other people will live. Suppose you falter in your utilitarian devotion. You say, gosh, it's really too bad that those five people are gonna die if I don't get eviscerated, but still, I think I have a life of my own to live. I think I was not born to sacrifice my life for others. If you say that in a good utilitarian world, the marshals from the Radiant End Organ Donation Committee will show up at your door and escort you to the operating table. The point I want to especially make here is that all of that makes perfectly good sense if you buy into any radiant end doctrine. If you buy into any radiant end doctrine, it's absurd for you to say, but I have a life of my own. I have goals of my own that in themselves have high significance. If you buy into any radiant end doctrine, it's even more absurd to say, I have a right to live my life as I choose. I have a right to pursue my happiness in the way that I conceive it to be appropriately pursued. Once again, we're seeing how essential the sort of individualist perspective is for even the intelligibility of talking about something like a basic right to liberty. I'm going to have to skip a whole bunch of pages here. Let's see. I want to talk now a little bit more in terms of the language of every life matters. In what way do others' lives matter to Jane, who we talked about for a minute, and to each of us? In what way do other lives give each of us reason to be circumspect in our conduct towards other people, to be circumspect, to be restrained, not to do everything, to avoid treating them in certain sorts of ways. What reason do we have this with respect to other people? Is there some deep fact about other people that gives us reason to place limits on what we do to others? Even though others' lives matter to them, why shouldn't each of us treat other people as though they are bits of available raw material, available mere objects for us to make use of as we see fit? I think one answer, a good answer, is that other people are not mere objects, are not born to serve one's own needs. Rather, they are beings with ends of their own, people with lives of their own to realize or fulfill. It seems incredible that this sharp difference between other persons and bits of clay or moss 
does not make a difference in how one should conduct oneself towards them, right? Isn't there something special here that marks other persons or from bits of clay, little bits of moss? The difference that there is here is not one that makes other people beings whose ends one ought to serve. The, that construal of the import for each of us of the fact that others also have ends of their own would contravene the separateness of persons. It would contravene the idea that all persons have ends of their own. The fact that other people have ends can't mean or suggest or imply that what I ought to do is to surrender my ends for the sake of their ends, or that they should surrender their ends for the sake of my ends. So what can it mean? What can be the import of others also having purposes of their own, which is rational for them to pursue? I say that the basic import has to be that one ought to not interfere with others in their non-interfering pursuit of their own life-defining ends. I think we've got this up on the screen. The claim that each person can validly make against all others on the basis of the slogan that each life matters is the claim to a natural right to liberty. That is, the claim to a natural right to pursue one's own ends in one's own chosen ways. One recognizes the status of others as independent beings with ends of their own, not by surrendering one's own ends, but rather by pursuing one's own ends only in ways that do not treat others as means to one's own ends. That I think is the core message of the whole tradition of natural rights theory. Next time I speak to you, I'll be speaking about property rights and their relationship to natural rights, but thank you very much for your attention. The first question is, uh, Professor Mack, what might be some of the best objections to the natural rights view that you presented here? Mm -hmm. um, hmm. Well, of course, you know, any form of deep skepticism is going to be undercutting to the view. Um, and in the original version of the lecture, I tried to dissuade people from that by talking about just common sense recognition of values and so on. Um, I think the way to respond to this skeptic is to point out that this view starts with the most minimum understanding of what practical rationality is, namely that it's um, <clears throat> the pursuit and achievement of one's own self-interest, uh, but then argues that the fact that not only oneself, but others ought to pursue their own interest or well-being um, makes a difference in how one should conduct oneself towards those other people. So there's a, there's a type, there's a, it, it's a, it starts as a morally very minimalist position, but it requires this additional turn where we say, if we're going to take seriously the fact that we ourselves or I myself am not the only being that have these ends, which it's rational for me or other people to pursue, then that has some sort of an impact on how I should um, conduct myself towards them. So let me just give an example of uh, that I often try to use. I uh, it, and it's the old-fashioned uh, Westworld story, not the complicated new one that I can't understand, um, in which uh, people go to Westworld thinking that they're just going to be shooting and killing automatons. In my story, uh, they have a great time, and then as they leave they're informed that these were actual real people. <laughs> and the immediate response of any sort of non-psychotic person would be to be uh, profoundly upset 
and to believe that they had to immediately come up with some sort of excuse for what they had done. Um, and they would say things like, well, I was led to believe that these were merely automatons. Um, and the reason people uh, would have that reaction is because they have a perception, this is just a persuasive argument on my part, that uh, it matters that these other things are not just robots, unconscious robots, or not however we characterize them. We have this perception that it matters. <clears throat> so the question is, how does it matter? And then my argument is, it matters not by way of there being a requirement that we adopt their ends as our ends, but it matters by way of requiring that we not treat them as beings that merely exist for our ends. That's the closest I can come to a quick, quick response. Okay, so let's press a little bit more on the minimalism point that you just mentioned. Uh, one question that came up quite a bit during the uh, break was about the relationship between Locke's account of natural rights and maybe natural rights theory in general and the metaphysical grounding of that view. So uh, can you speak a little bit more to how Locke grounded his account of natural rights yeah. in theology yeah. and yeah. whether all such natural rights accounts need to be grounded in some similar account? Yeah, um, so it's, it's a complicated story in Locke, but uh, one thing that uh, anyone who has even a sort of fleeting acquaintance with Locke will have noticed is that I left out in my lecture the one argument that, that is presented as an argument for natural rights by Locke, uh, which is which depends explicitly on theological premises. And that's the argument that, uh, that, uh, um, that we are all the workmanship of God. And it's wrong for one of us to kill another unprovoked and so on, because, well, because we're all really the property of God and we're, we're trespassing upon God. And the funny thing about that as an argument for Locke to stick in there is that it's not an argument for human beings having rights is an argument for God having rights over all human beings. So it, it's anomalous and it's not quite clear why it's in there. Um, uh, but the more general, I think, point to make is that uh, Locke did hold, unfortunately, to the view that um, all obligation depends upon the command of a superior. Um, in that way, he agrees with Hobbes. And so his position seems to be, I have all these good reasons for why people shouldn't treat other people as though these other people are their property. Um, but if you ask me why people are obligated not to treat people as though they're the property of the actor, my answer has to be that all obligation goes back to God. And so it's because God issued a divine law against killing people that this obligation exists and that is that it is unlawful to kill people. And my view is that Locke could have um, jettisoned all of that. <laughs> he only needs the, uh, the arguments for why each of us has reason not to treat other people in some of these ways. Um, and just as a little historical note, I guess I'm addressing everyone out there. Um, uh, the interesting thing is that the, the a figure who's a generation and a half or so earlier than Locke, Hugo Grotius, comes to the same branch in the philosophical road. He gives certain sorts of arguments, which in some ways are like Locke's about why we have reasons to be constrained in how we treat other people. And he says, these reasons depend upon certain facts about human nature. And then he says, if that's true, does it matter one way or the other whether God exists or whether God cares anything about this? And he goes, well, it's kind of sinful to say this, but the answer is no. <laughs> and Locke can't get himself to say that. Uh, Locke, and that's because Locke still endorses the idea 
that law has to be the product of a superior commander. And so natural law has to have a has to have its source in some sort of a command, some sort of voice of a sovereign. Uh, and that's not an existing secular sovereign, it has to be God, right? And so once again, I think last sentence on this. <laughs> uh, the idea that law has to come from the decrees or the commands of the sovereign is the one characteristically authoritarian principle <laughs> that Locke can't get rid of, right? Other people at the time are getting rid of it, but Locke doesn't. Interesting. So on your account then, uh, distancing ourselves from Locke, yeah. what kinds of responsibilities or duties come hand in hand with these rights that you've described? Yeah. Well, with the natural rights, the, uh, the duties are all negative. Uh, the duties are not to uh, engage in certain uh, uh, interferences or certain constraints or certain sort of violence towards other people. Um, the world is full of positive rights that people have, uh, but those rights uh, are not among our natural rights. They arise, as I mentioned, as, as particular property rights or contractual rights. And for instance, very importantly, uh, 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 rights to restitution for wrongs that have been done. Um, and a lot of the nitty gritty of what rights people have is not something that philosophers should try to explain. Uh, what happens is that through all sorts of historical contingencies, uh, through all sorts of conventions that could have arisen, but maybe didn't or have arisen, uh, a, a particular concretization of what our rights are understood to be arises. And um, uh, so one example of this might be that at one point, uh, uh, you didn't violate people's rights if you smoked a cigarette near them. <laughs> and now it is a violation. And it's not just because now we know that it's dangerous. It's because a different set of social expectations have arisen. So exactly what rights it makes sense to say a particular individual has is not going to be revealed by a philosophical dis discussion of what abstract rights people have. It'll very much depend upon time and place and historical contingencies. And uh, yeah, uh, so um, uh, it would, I, I think the only theorist I know of who I think is a powerful theorist in some ways who thinks that some abstract philosophical explication of our basic rights is all that we need to settle every dispute <laughs> that could arise among people is a good old uh, Lysander Spooner. Uh, he thinks that he doesn't have any understanding of how these abstract rights have to become concretized by taking particular time and place determined form. Okay, good. So we have time for just one more question. Oh. And, and there's a, a natural segue to your last point there, which is a couple of people were curious about what, what might be a tension in this account between the necessity of social recognition, which you just described, right? And the, the, the way that uh, our understanding of these rights change from time to place. Uh, and their their naturalness. So they, yes. they might not have been recognized for much of human history, but they are recognized now. So how should we think about that sort of quality of recognition relating to our ability to claim these rights? Yeah, so I'm not sure now. There's the, there's the question about rec not recognized before, or, but recognized now. And there's the question about... Uh, recognized in certain specific concrete forms. Um, um, I, it's not the case <laughs> that in order to have rights, they have to be recognized, right? That, that broad claim, I think, is false. Uh, and 
a uh, good friend of mine, Jerry Gow, sometimes endorses that claim, but uh, even though he's very, very smart, he's, I think, wrong about that. Um, um, so my view is that um, um, the most base, these basic abstract rights that people have, people have entirely independently of whether they're recognized by other people. And maybe also entirely independently of whether other people can sort of be motivated to recognize them. So the technical term I guess here is a debate between internalist and externalist and internalists say, uh, uh, you, someone can't have a claim against you unless somehow a correct understanding of your own set of values will motivate you to recognize that claim. And I, I reject that. I think the, that's the minority opinion, the, the externalist view, that uh, there may be some people who you can't get from what they currently value <laughs> to what you want them to affirm as a moral proposition. But that doesn't mean that that moral proposition isn't valid for them. That's the externalist view. That's the view I do. Uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, it could be that um, uh, we very much need these conventions, right? And so, and people are very good at developing them. So the example I think of is uh, when people go out and they start panning for gold in streams, right? Uh, in areas which are not owned by anybody, and there often is not any government around, right, to declare what counts. And uh, there's a type of simultaneous beginning of that activity and people working out what they will recognize among one another as the rules of whether you've established a certain type of claim that allows you to be the only person that pans in a certain sort of area. If, if, none, if rules like that don't appear, then people can say, it's really bad that our abstract right to property doesn't have a determinate form here. <laughs> and it won't have a determinate form. That'll be bad, uh, but it can get a determinate form and typically does, not through legislation, but through people figuring out if John Hasness is out there, he really wants me to say this, right? Uh, uh, by people stumbling upon ways to resolve these disputes and gradually getting somewhat clearer on what the boundaries are in that world with those people. But it doesn't mean that those people don't bring to the problem uh, abstract rights and the solutions that they come up with have to accord with those rights. They have the solutions have to be eligible because they're not outside of the abstract boundaries that the rights define. 